Okay, um, so we're going to talk about memory operand examples and assembly language basics. Um, do a very quick review, although we just finished uh, 10 minutes ago. Um, so we talk about the six segment registers. Each segment has 64 kilobytes, and all the segments starts on 16 byte boundary. Um, logical address has two pieces of information, SBA and EA. SBA stands for segment base address, EA stands for effective address. Physical address is the actual memory address used by the microprocessor to read or write data. And the way we do the translation is to shift the segment base register to the left for four bits and then add the effective address. To calculate the effective address, and we need to look at what is the addressing mode used in the instruction. We talk about these six different addressing modes. First one is the direct addressing mode where you have a constant number inside the pair of brackets. And that constant number is the effective address. So that's the simplest way, simplest addressing mode. The second addressing mode is the register indirect. Uh, so where you will have one register only within that pair of brackets. Most of these effective address in, in this register indirect addressing mode they will use DS by default unless you put in a DS column example as a prefix. BP and SP is used with seven base um, only. The third addressing mode is the base index. So you have a base register plus a uh, index register. So you have two registers together uh, connected with a plus sign um, put into the help brackets. The fourth one is the register relative, where you have a register and a constant number. Next one is everything all together. You have base register, index register, and then constant. And the last one is so-called scale index, where you have a register plus a scaling factor times the second register. All these addressing modes, their goal is to tell you how to calculate the effective address. Okay, that's the same. Every addressing mode, eventually, you should, well, the microprocessor should be able to figure out what is the effective address. And then we can use the effective address to calculate the physical address. For this different addressing mode, because they use different pieces of information, and that's why they have different names. OK, example, um, assume we have the information about these registers, CS, DS, ESI, EDI, and EBX. We gave you ESI, EDI, EBX, but you know from those, you can easily figure out SI, DI, and EBX. That's essentially the lower 16 bit of that register. Destination operand, um, what is the um, physical address of this destination operand. Okay, why don't you work on it? Uh, I believe this is one of the review questions that I uh, would like to give out, but didn't point out. So let, let's do this uh, in the next couple of minutes. What is the um, physical address of the destination operand of this first instruction? And what is the physical address of this source our plan in the second instruction. Let's start from the first one. What is the physical address of the destination operand in move bracket di and in bracket comma ax? So again, we need to know SBA and EA. Like, what is SBA? What is the segment base address? Which segment register do you use? 
because there's no other information, so we need a DS. Okay. And then what is the effective address? Okay. It's DI because that's the registering direct addressing mode, right? And um, so we know that the value in DI is going to be the effective address. So we're going to take what's in DS, so 0, E, 0, 0, okay? And we're going to shift that. And we're going to add the value of DI. What is the value of DI? 0, 2, 0, 0. We do this addition, so that's going to be 0, E, 2, 0, 0. This is the effective address. This is the physical address. Right? So we're going to do this fun example destination operand in this instruction. Which one is the destination operand? This one is the destination operand. It's memory operand because of brackets, right? And here you have everything. So we do add everything. Again, what is the SVA? DS by default. So we're going to find out it's DS and we add the extra zero. And that's the same. This is shifting, okay? Last one. Again, the last one. So we're going to take the value from BX, from DI, and then we're going to also consider this 0, 4, 0, 0. What is in BX? 0, 3, 0, 0. Good. What is in DI? 0, 2, 0, 0. And then the third element is this 0, 4, 0, 0. Okay? So we're going to add the R. So we'll have 0, 0. This is... Uh, Nine. So zero B nine zero zero. That's the physical address of this operand. Any questions? That's the physical address or it's the same for in real mode, um, because there's no additional translation. So, as you can see, the uh, calculation is straightforward. The only thing you need to really understand is what are the things we need to use, what are the values from what registers we need to use to calculate the effective address. So in this case, these three together give you the effective address. All right, here's uh, this example solutions. Um, so we did the last one just now. Uh, as you can see, we need to figure out the effective address, which consists of three elements, BX, DI, and 0400. We add them all together. That's 0900. That's the effective address. And the uh, linear address is this DS. This is a shifted DS. Okay. This last zero is the one we added, and then we add this effective address, and eventually we got zero B nine zero zero. Good. So now we're going to start looking at the actual instructions. And before we do that, we already gave you some examples: add, move, and with operands. Um, so what we have here, we're going to look at the general format, or we call it dynamic, that describes its operation. 
And this is often called upper code as well. So we used these two examples, move add. Move is to do the data transfer. In fact, this is the copy. And add is the arithmetic, do the addition. Then we can have and, that's an example of logic operations. And then we can have jump. Uh, and this is the unconditional jump. That's for control transfer. So each instruction begins with such enomic to describe its function. And then followed by operands. It depends on the actual instruction. You may have one operand uh, or two operands or sometimes no operand. Operands are other parts of assembly language instruction. Operands identify whether the elements of data to be processed are in registers or memory. If it's in memory, then what is the effective address? You know, then th that's the story we just talk about with the brackets. What are the elements in the brackets? Source operand and the destination operand. Source operand is the location of one operand to be processed. Destination operand is the location uh, of the other operand to be processed and the location of the result. Uh, we explained last week, well, Monday, no, Tuesday, in fact. We explained for Intel instructions why you don't see three operands, right? Because it requires extra bits to encode. So with two operands, when you do uh, operations such as addition, you already have to use them to specify both operands to be added. Also, one of them is used to specify where we store the result, and that's the destination operand. The general structure of assembly language statement is like this. Uh, it can optionally begin with a label, colon, and then instruction, and semicolon, uh, comment. You do not have to have a label or a comment. You can have an instruction just by itself without label at the beginning or comment at the end. Label gives the address identifier for that statement or for that instruction. And can you think about a case when we need such a label? Jump. Okay. You want to change the program execution path. So you want to jump, for example, back to the beginning of your program for a loop. Then where do you jump to? You need to somehow tell the program and tell the microprocessor where to jump to. In that case, you can use label as the target you want to jump to. For example, we can have a, this line start, colon, move, ax, comma, bx, semicolon, copy bx into ax. So this is a complete statement with label, instruction and comment so there's a start and later of your program you can say jump space start so that jump instruction will take the microprocessor back to this particular instruction because this instruction is labeled as start okay, that's the use case of the label in other examples uh, increment si or inc si is to update the pointer, and we do not have a label here, but we do have a comment. And the last instruction example, uh, just have the instruction itself, no label or comment. Few instructions have a label, really uh, marks the jump to point. Uh, not all instructions need a comment. But I want to, uh, emphasize that when you write your assembly language program, you do want to provide enough comment so um, you will help yourself understand it uh, at a later time, also help other people understand it when you work in a team environment. 
same as you when you write a high level language program. When you write C programs, you're going to put comments in your program. Same thing here. And especially more important than C, because from C, compared to C and assembly, it generally easier to figure out what I'm trying to do in the C program than what you are trying to do in assembly entry program, because everything is uh, such register based. Uh, if you do not have a picture of the algorithms or the steps of your program, uh, it's very hard to understand. So it's important to have enough adequate comments in your assembly language program. Instruction encoding. Access 6 instruction set is of variable length. It ranges from 1 byte to 6 bytes. Here, just to be clear, we're not talking about the actual data size. We're not talking about 2-bit, uh, well, I mean 8-bit registers or 16-bit registers. We're talking about the instruction itself, okay? like the jump instruction or the uh, addition instruction. Those instructions will eventually be encoded in machine code, in the binaries, to be loaded to the microprocessor. For the instructions themselves, they can take different length. Some instructions take one byte, some instructions take six bytes. And for uh, later processors, they have newer instructions uh, take up to 17 bytes. So when you have a code segment, let's see, in this memory space, you have the code segment. Okay, this is CS colon IP. Okay. And it, it starts from CS colon zero. So the CS colon IP that points to the instruction the microprocessor will execute next. Always. Because once you finish executing one instruction, it will update this IP so that it can get to the next instruction and load the instruction. So let's say you have IP and IP plus one, IP plus two, and these each box here is a byte. Each box here is a byte. So let's say this is A B, this is zero four, and three five, and seven eight. Okay, I'm just making up these numbers, and these numbers. Uh, may or may not be valid instructions, but let's assume they are all valid um, instruction code. So when the microprocessor tries to execute this next instruction, it'll use this CS colon IP to find this location and then read uh, bytes one by one. Now the question here is, hey, how do you know this is an instruction of one byte or two bytes or up to 16, 17 bytes. It's all possible, right? Because all the instructions, well, they don't have a fixed length. It could be um, any arbitrary length between one and 17. What the microprocessor is gonna do here is try to decode. Decode instructions. Because the information here is binary. And the instructions are encoded in some way. For example, the upper code is the first thing you encode. By upper code, we mean move, add, increment, jump. These other things, information will be encoded. So ADD may be 0, 1, 0. Uh, increment might maybe zero zero one one. So the first several bits here will represent what kind of operation it is, and then the next several bits will represent how many operands I have, and the next several bits will say, is this instruction going to use register EAX, or does it have a memory operand? which is bracket VX, blah, blah, blah. So 
this here, this picture here, just try to illustrate the encoding of these instructions. So you will have some bits to represent what kind of upper code this instruction is going to do, and what are the operands, and how many of them, etc. When the microprocessor get loading, gets to this point below these bytes, it will do the reverse. It will try to decipher or decode these individual bits to figure out the actual operation, figure out the operand, and so on. Um, because of this variable length, so the decoding is actually uh, very complicated. Well, the benefit of this variable length, on the other hand, is to make the program compact. Think about if you have every instruction is taking 64 bits, right, or 8 bytes. Whereas, indeed, some of the instructions, they don't need that many bits, because it's just, it's just a very simple instruction. So you're, in that case, using fixed lines of instructions, you're wasting a lot of space. So the benefit of using this variable lines is actually reduce the program space, reduce the bytes that your program takes. Of course, you have to sacrifice on um, the code. It's getting more complicated on the code. So there's a trade-off. Um, this verbal lens allows for many addressing modes, allows full-size immediate data, and instruction can use as many bytes as necessary. So that's kind of um, beneficial for reducing the size of the overall the overall size of the program. The disadvantage of verbal lens is that it requires more complicated decoding hardware, and the speed of decoding is critical. Many other microprocessors use fixed lens, for example, MIPS and also ARM. Well, ARM, not strict fixed length, they have different um, fixed lengths. But this is just some design um, decisions that when they initially design the microprocessor, they have to make such decisions. Whether to sacrifice uh, on the decoding speed to re reduce the code size or to the other. So what are the information encoded in an instruction? We talk about operand, that's to say what kind of operation this instruction is going to do, and what operands, either register or memory, and for the register is a, a single byte register or word or double word, uh, because imagine that if you do move AL comma BL, that's different from you do move AX comma VX, right? Because the, the size of these registers are different. And also operands, uh, are they in register or in memory? And uh, if it is in memory, how uh, are we gonna calculate the effective address? This is just a, a bigger uh, diagram from the first slide, uh, where just show show you uh, what are the information including in the first byte, what are the information coming in the second byte, and then for later bytes, how we're going to use that. You do not need to remember this. Okay, this just for your information, just to explain what really happens when the assembly language instruction gets con converted into machine code, into binary, and how the microprocessor decode it to understand what the instruction is. This encoding and decoding are all done by, well, encoding is done by the assembler, decoding is done by the microprocessor itself. Just a very quick review on the x86 registers we have um, 16, um, we have general purpose registers, 16 or 32 bit. We have data registers can hold 8 bit data as well. And the register name will tell you the size of the registers. And we have uh, accumulator register, for example. Uh, we have AL, AH, both are byte wide. And we have AX, it's a word. 
and then we have EAX, which is takes the entire 32 bit. So given this value in EAX, uh, you should be able to find out what is the value in AL, AH, or AX. Memory accesses. Now, I asked you a question, for example, if we move AX comma bracket 100H, how many bytes will be read from memory? And I said two. The reason I know, because AX, the destination register, is a word. It has two bytes. And that's how many bytes it required from memory. So this instruction will read two bytes from memory. And from what location? And that's the question about the logical address and then physical address. Logical address has two pieces of information, SBA and EA. And by default, we're going to use DS. So SBA, in this case, is DS. And the EA is, because this is a, a constant number within the brackets, and we can easily figure out the effective address is this one. And sometimes it's necessary to specify the size. We're going to use this size information, the pointer ahead of this bracket. For example, we're going to do move sign extension EAX byte pointer 100H. So this seems a little bit uh, complicated. What this instruction does is that it will copy a byte from memory to register. We're going to copy a byte from memory because this byte pointer, what we're trying to say, we're going to use DS colon 100, that logical address, to read a byte from memory. But look at the destination. This is a 32-bit. Okay. We're trying to put a byte into a 32-bit register. What we do here is different from the plain move. We're going to do a sign extension. So look at the byte. We're going to look at the sign bit of that byte. We're going to extend the sign bit to the upper 24 bits. Because we got 8, but the destination is 32. So we're going to fill in the upper 24 bits using the sign bit from the byte. That's called the sign extension. So eventually, if you, yeah, so if, you, if you have a zero and the sign bit, then you get all zeros on the upper 24 bits. If you have one on the sign bit, you get all ones on the upper 24 bits. Now, why do we do that? And that actually gives you a nice sign number with the same value as the byte. And if you do the calculation, you get a zero on the sign bit, so that's the same value. If it is a negative number, or well, if it's a one on sign bit, that's a negative number, then after sign extension, you actually retain the same value in the 32 bit register. If it's minus five, that's still a minus five because of the sign extension. Um, I'm sorry, um, I think I'm, oh, this is a zero extension. Uh, take it back. If it is SX, that's a sign extension, that's what I just explained. But in this case, this is a zero extension. So you just simply put in zero on the upper 24 bits. Okay, um, remember x86 uses little Indian um, data. All right, uh, that's the last slide. Um, so the lecture is done today, and uh, please remember to sign up on piazza.com, and also the first homework is due uh, the coming Tuesday. Okay, I'll see you next week. Not for sure, not all awesome for next week. Um.